Good evening. We'll allow for a few moments for everybody to arrive, but welcome everyone to this uh, today's session of Beyond By Town. All right, fantastic. So we've had a little bit of time for folks to filter in and I'm sure uh, some more folks will be filtering in as well. We're also live on Facebook uh, streaming this. So um, a big welcome to all the folks who are watching us from Facebook as well. Uh, my name is SC and I am the Visitor and Community Engagement Manager at the Bytown Museum. And I'd like to welcome everybody to this evening's session of Beyond Bytown featuring Chloe Dennis and Adam Wiegert. Uh, so this evening, Evening, we are going to be uh, highlighting our collaboration with the Carlton Immersive Media Studio uh, Lab uh, on one of our digitization projects. So Chloe Dennis is the Digital Initiatives Lead at the Bytown Museum, who will be discussing the Stories from the Collection project, which uses photogrammetry to develop 3D models of artifacts from our collections that have mostly been kept in storage over the year. And she's joined by Adam Wiegert from the Carlton Immersive Media Studio to discuss the project. The initiative is designed to enhance digital access to our museum's offerings with an online and in-gallery experience that's going to be launching very, very soon. We're all very excited to hear about it. So welcome, Chloe and Adam. Uh, it's a pleasure to speak with you guys this evening. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks, SC. Yeah, of course. Great. Well, uh, I think now that we've got a fair number of folks who are here and we've had a little bit of an introduction, how about we jump right into the presentation? So uh, I will be turning off my camera for the presentation to give you guys the spotlight, but uh, Chloe, if you'd like, yeah, you can take it away. Perfect. Thanks, SC. So I'm just going to share my screen and then we'll get started. Oh, sorry. Oh yeah, there we go. All right. Okay, so yeah, good evening, everyone. Really, thank you for joining us. So I'm Chloe, as SC mentioned, and the plan for tonight is to introduce the museum's latest 3D digitization project, Stories from the Collection, and provide behind the scenes information for how this project came to be. Then afterward, Adam will give a bit of a rundown of the 3D modeling process we use, which is called photogrammetry. And lastly, I will give a preview of the project website that will be launching in the coming weeks. So let's get started. So first, just what is Stories from the Collection? So Stories from the Collection is a project that's funded by the Government of Canada Then, over the past year has allowed the Bytown Museum to ultimately explore new digital technologies and tools to increase access to our collection. So the goals from this project from the beginning were to 3D model a selection of artifacts from our collection and develop an engaging website to host them that would be available in three languages. We basically wanted to take artifacts out of storage and out of the display cases and really put them in the digital hands of our visitors. So from these goals, Stories from the Collection came to be a storytelling project that sought to tell the history of Bytown and Ottawa in a new way. So in order to achieve these goals, the first phase of the project was centered around selecting which artifacts would be included in the project for digitization. 
And this seemed like quite the challenge at first because we do have around 10,000 artifacts in our collection and we budgeted to model up to 30 for this project. So that's quite a range. So to help, help narrow that down, um, we asked our community what type of artifacts they would like to see as part of the project. Between artifacts in storage, artifacts on display, everyday items, artifacts of national importance, or artifacts with a local story. So here are the results from that survey that we issued. 43% of respondents chose artifacts in storage, 0% chose artifacts on display, 3% chose everyday items, 8% chose artifacts of national importance, and 45% chose artifacts with a local story. So as we can see, overwhelmingly, survey respondents want to see artifacts in storage and artifacts with a local story included in this project. So this now gave me some parameters. And I began to survey our collection for artifacts that caught my eye or had an interesting story attached to them, but I still found myself quite stuck in what to pick. Until one day I was really brainstorming what I wanted the project's like big idea to be. And that big idea became that artifacts tell stories. And this really helped me define the project more fully. So I really saw this project as an opportunity to interpret artifacts and highlight new narratives that supplement the existing ones within our permanent gallery at the museum. And the first concept for this project became 30 artifacts for 30 moments in Bytown history. So I began doing some cursory research to establish a list of moments in Bytown history. And I pulled this from various books, articles, artifact records, things like that. And as a result, my first draft of this moments list was about 120 long, which is quite a lot. So I began to pull artifacts from the collection that could be tied to each of these moments and trying my best to have multiple artifacts for each, just in case uh, down the line, I need to adjust when it came to digitizing. And then uh, I consulted with the museum senior manager of collections and exhibitions, Grant, and we took a trip to the Diefenbunker Museum, which is actually where the Bytown Museum stores our collection. And we did a check on all the condition of the artifacts. And after this, we were able to narrow down that list of 120 moments down to 30 and 60 artifacts, so two per moment. And some artifacts didn't make this final list due to their fragile condition, or their size and weight that would make it tricky to move and position the artifact for digitization, or simply if one artifact store was just more stronger or more compelling or more in line with the interests of our community. So with this, we were now ready to begin the digitization process. And Adam's gonna speak a bit more on this later but it did consist of many trips to the Diefenbunker in the summer and fall months last year. And that list of 30 artifacts had to be adjusted a little bit as digitization went on, but we were able to model 30 artifacts in the end, including a mayor's chair from 1876, the commissariat building where the museum is housed, the fan favorite Darcy McGee death hand, a carpenter's chest built by a former Rideau Canal foreman, and a nurse's military tunic from the South African War, among various others. So as digitization was underway, I began conducting in-depth research into each artifact to uncover their stories. So using books, historical newspapers, artifact files, etc., I developed a, uh, labels for each artifact that will be featured on the project website for visitors to read about their stories. And to give you an idea, of what artifacts are included in the project, I've chosen a couple to highlight tonight that contain my favorite stories. So first, we have Bytown's first letterbox. Um, the image on the screen here is of a closed wooden box with a slot on top. So on April 6, 1829, Matthew Connell was appointed as Bytown's first postmaster and the Bytown post office was established. And this is the box where the town's mail was received and sent at the time. And the first post office was located just north of Rideau Street near today's Byward Market building. And it ran out of a general store that Connell owned. And at the time, uh, mail arrived to Bytown Post Office in the morning on horseback. And it is said that Connell blew a horn at when the mail arrived every morning to let the residents know the mail was there. 
And Connell was postmaster of Bytown until 1834 when he passed. And the Bytown post office continued to operate until January 1st, 1855, when Bytown became the city of Ottawa and the name changed. Next, we have a fare box from the Ottawa Electric Railway. And the image on the screen here is of a narrow metal box with a window, handle, and a coin slot on top. So the Ottawa Electric Railway was founded in 1891 by Thomas Ahern and Warren Soper, who were known as pioneer industrialists in the city when it came to harnessing electricity. They, bought, they brought electric streetcars to Ottawa, which eventually ran from New Edinburgh to Britannia Village, and it became many people's preferred mode of transportation until 1955 when they ceased operation entirely and buses became the prominent mode of public transport in the city. So streetcar riders would deposit their fare into this fare box. Today, pay points for public transit are located at the entrances of public transit vehicles or at stations themselves. But the early streetcars of Ottawa uh, were staffed by a conductor and a motorman, and the conductor would walk through the car passing this fare box along, each row to collect payment from riders. But by 1926, fare boxes became affixed to the front of streetcars so that riders could pay their fare when they entered the streetcar. And there's an article from the Ottawa Citizen in 1991 that shares stories from Ottawa residents on their memories of the city's former streetcar service. And there's one story from that article I particularly liked from Louise Lucas, who recalled the time when she lost her ticket for the streetcar when she was leaving school in the sixth grade. And she panicked, so she picked up a small stone when she was leaving school just before getting on the car and she dropped it into the fare box. And she recalls it making a pinball machine-like noise on its way down. And to her surprise and relief, the driver let her on without a fuss. Lastly, this is a shoe brush from the former electrical supply store, Garriott Goddard & Co, that was once located on Elgin Street. And the image on the screen here is of a small wooden brush with bristles and inscribed with an ad for Garriott Goddard & Co on top. So now this one may not seem like much, but I'm gonna elaborate. So the Bytown Museum, is housed in the Commissariat Building, which formerly functioned as a central hub for the construction of the Rideau Canal in the 1820s and 30s. And it continued to service the canal and its workers thereafter. And this shoe brush was actually found in the attic of the Commissariat Building by the founders of the Bytown Museum, the Women's Canadian Historical Society of Ottawa, when they moved into the building in 1951 to reopen the Bytown Museum there in 1952. And it actually became part of the museum's permanent collection in this way. It's also not the only artifact in our collection with the same story. So I just find this artifact really encapsulates the project uh, very well and the idea that artifacts tell stories. Because at first glance, it really just seems like a brush, but you dissect it a little more and it really signifies the lived history of the building from industry and labor in Bytown and early Ottawa to the momentous occasion of the Women's Canadian Historical Society of Ottawa moving into the building over a hundred years after its initial use as a canal warehouse and where the Bytown Museum remains today. So that's it for me for now. I'm gonna hand things over to Adam uh, to discuss photogrammetry and digitization. And then I'll be back at the end to give a preview of the upcoming website for stories from the collection. So, thank you. Thanks, Chloe. So yeah, my name's Adam. And I'm gonna. I'm from the Carlton Immersive Media Studio, which is a research lab affiliated with the School of Architecture at Carlton. And if you're wondering what we do, um, the Carlton Immersive Media Studio. It's we're engaged in theoretical and applied multidisciplinary research concerned with the integration of new and emerging digital technologies into non and semi digital workflows. And we collaborate with public and private non-for-profit partners on projects that address diverse but related research challenges in the architecture, engineering, construction, and operations industry, biomedicine, economic development, forensic evidence, and heritage conservation, which we're looking at today. And let me just share my screen so you can see my presentation. There we go. Let me know if you can't see it and I'll start. So, and also the Carlton Immersive Media Studio has four different streams of research. 
uh, digitization, modeling, digitally assisted storytelling, and digitally assisted fabrication. And, and they're generally related to the field of heritage conservation. And uh, we consider the, the, um, this project to be in the digitization and the storytelling aspects of our research as well. So it, it uh, dovetailed nicely with our, our research at Carleton. And I have to give a shout out to the, some of the other team members that worked on the project, Ben Goforth and Pedro Pariah. They helped on site doing the acquisition and some of the processing, a lot of the processing that was done for the photogrammetry. So if you're wondering what is photogrammetry, what's this thing? Um, it's a technique that we use in digitization where we can make a, a virtual 3D model of an object by taking uh, multiple overlapping photos around the object. Uh, and then and then we can align all those together and make a 3D model like you see on the on the screen here. This is a if you don't recognize it, it's a uh, it's part of the lock system on the Rideau Canal. Uh, it, this one's actually from Hartwell's locks close to Carleton University. And so as part of the acquisition, we were some some of most of the artifacts uh, were in the Diefen bunker. For this project, but some of them were were housed in the Bytown Museum, so we 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 go on site and we are able to take the photos of the artifacts to create the three D models. And sometimes, uh, so like typically, we're uh, a lot of the smaller objects are are done on a turntable, whereas the larger objects we have to actually move around them. They're too big to fit on on the turntable that we use. And then when we were doing the commissariat building, uh, it was actually somewhat of a challenging building to 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 do photogrammetry of. Typically, we'll use a drone to get all the way on top of the building, uh, but this is is so close to the the parliamentary precinct, so it's it's much harder to fly a drone in this area. So we use other techniques like using a telephoto lens and a thirty foot um, tripod pole to put the camera on. So we can get the higher parts of the walls and take photos of the roof as well. And then also we're using the, the same tripod for documenting the ruins across from the commissariat building. So as part of the acquisition, you can see in this video, I'm taking, uh, I'm turning around the turntable with the object spinning on it, the camera's in one place. And we're using um, remote shutter flashes to to lighten to expose the object uh, to the camera so we want to get both sides of the object when we're doing the scanning <clears throat> so we'll do one photogrammetry scan around the object in one position and then we will flip it over and then do another scan and then align them together to get our full 3d model so here is a example of a series of photos that we take uh, some of, and and for depending on the complexity of the object and the size, uh, will, it, it will affect the number of images that we take. So for the smaller objects, the simplest objects might have been around fifty photos. The most complex object uh, might have been around twenty five hundred photos to align in the end. So the way that the software we so we we take the photos, uh, we do some color correction, some uh, brightness correction and we put it into a photogrammetry software. And that software analyzes the photos and finds all of these feature points so you can see the different dots on the photos. It does that for all of the photos, and then it matches those feature points together and it will align it in 3D space. So you can see all of the blue squares are the different photos from the positions that we took them in. And then this is a like sort of sparse, we call it a point cloud. It's a series of points that make up the image, the, the 3D model. Uh, but those are also the points that you saw in this previous image that uh, that tie all the photos together for this virtual alignment of all the photos. And then we can make what's called a mesh. So it's actually millions of little tiny triangles all connected together to make this three surface. Um, and then we can and then of course we have to flip over the object. And something else you see in this photo is if you can see it says target 71 and and then the other other target these are calibrated scale bars that we use so the technique of photogrammetry it doesn't have the ability to uh, know the actual scale of the object it knows a relative scale 
So if you just do photogrammetry without any measurements, without any inputting any sort of calibration into it, you know, this, this object could be this tiny, it could be kilometers wide, it, it doesn't know. So we use these calibrated scale bars to set that scale uh, into the 3D model. And then here we can see all of the uh, photos from the other side of this object together and the resulting 3D mesh. And then we're able to combine these two sides together uh, in, in the photogrammetry software. And now, you, now we can see that all of the photos are, are aligned all together at one. So all of the photos that were that you could see on the bottom of the object were actually from when it was flipped over. And then the photos, all the blue squares that were that are on top of when, when we had the object right side up. And now I'll show you um, a few of my favorite objects that we were working on over the project. This is, uh, it's, a, it's a money scale. Um, and it, it just had really nice uh, texture, different types of metals, different finishes on the metals, and they and a lot of different details. Um, and and some of the thin parts of the objects came out very nicely. Sometimes, um, really thin objects with photogrammetry don't turn out very well, but this one turned out very nice. And then this is a hand seeder, so it's used to put seeds in the ground automatically, high technology, you know? Um, and, and then here's the, 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 the textured version of it. So something I didn't actually mention was after we get that 3D mesh of the object, we can then apply the color to it with the photos as well. So here's the difference between the, the two. So this is the mesh with all of the aligned photos around it, and then the textured mesh as we call it. So the actual color image applied to that surface. And this also turned out to be a really nice model. And then uh, another small object, this is actually a little toy tramway streetcar uh, th that we worked on. So you can see some of the, the fine geometry that we were able to, to scan with photogrammetry. And then my favorite, of course, if you haven't noticed, I do woodworking. I, I do some heritage carpentry myself. So this was, I was really excited to be able to scan um, this tool chest from John Summers, the foreman on the Rideau Canal. And it was, it was quite a challenge. It was a large object. It, we were in a small space. So these are all the different orientations that we had to scan the object in. So the smaller or the medium size objects, you know, we might've just had to flip once and scan. This one we actually had in five different orientations to scan. So I had to process all of those separately and then combine them later on. And it was mainly because we actually had the lid open and then we closed the lid. So we could, you can see on the top left, we can get more detail of that lid, uh, of, the, of the top of the lid and then the bottom as well and connect those different pieces together. And then we can see all of the, all of the photos connected together. And then um, we export that as a 3D model file, and that can be uploaded to the uh, the website. Hopefully, that made sense. I usually present uh, I'm very technically at a very technical level, so I hope that I was able to explain it at a at a reasonable level for a wider audience. So I'll hand it off to Chloe, and she can show how. All the three models are are uh, viewed through the website. Great, thanks, Adam. Made sense to me, so that was good. <laughs> All right, I'll just share my screen again, and we'll get going on the website. All right. So um, now that we all kind of understand how the project came to be, what it contains, and how we approach digitization, thanks to Adam. Uh, the last thing is to introduce you to the public facing side of Storage Sims Collection, which is our website. So once the project itself is launched, you'll be able to interact with the project via its website at bytownstories.ca. It's currently password protected, so I wouldn't go there right now. <laughs> um, but the website offers um, two different kinds of experiences, one that is storytelling driven and one that is collections driven. Uh, and I'm going to explore both of them tonight. Um, we're also happy to say that the website will be offered in three languages, uh, French, English, and Anishinaabemowin. 
And in addition to interacting with the project through the website remotely at home, in preparation for our upcoming summer season, visitors are also going to be able to interact uh, with the project on site at the museum as well. For that, we're planning to have QR codes throughout the muse museum's permanent ex exhibit that link to the models from the project and support and expand upon the existing narratives within the museum. So I'll begin with a walkthrough of the storytelling experience. So when you first go to the website here, you'll be prompted to select which language you'd like to continue in. And for the purposes of tonight's demo, we're going to be going through the English one, just because that's the most complete version of the site. So you'll find this is the landing page of the website. So they'll find this is how you can access the storytelling experience up top at the stories or the collection driven experience down at the bottom through the collection. There's also you can access them in the top corner up here. And the project page here is a bit of like an about page and it tells you about the project, kind of the how and why. So let's get going on the storytelling ex experience of the site. So the focus or the co concept for this aspect of the site is to present the 3D modeled artifacts to visitors in their chronological and geographical context. So the focus here is a map of Ottawa that the artifacts have been plotted onto, uh, tying each artifact to a relevant location in its story uh, as well. There's a consistent timeline on the screen as well that contains six dates that's significant to the history of Bytown in Ottawa. And as you explore the map, the artifacts and their moments uh, will appear on the same timeline as well. So the timeline starts uh, with the Anishinaabe Algonquin stewardship of the land and waterways since time immemorial. And it goes until 1952 when the Bytown Museum opened in the commissary building. So to Further, the storytelling aspect of the site, we've developed five themes that the artifacts and their stories fall into when telling the history of Bytown in Ottawa. And these are stories of industry and labor, disaster and war, everyday life, prominent people, and women. So once you've gone through these introductory texts at the bottom, which kind of go over what I just went through, you'll find yourself at the beginning of the timeline, which is starts with this Anishinaabe Algonquin stone tool. So there's a little preview of the bottle there. So from here, you can choose to explore the artifacts chronologically by clicking on these arrow prompts to go through the timeline. So here's another one here, the money chest of Colonel Bai. Um, or if you don't want to do that and you want to have a bit more freedom in how you're exploring this site, you can select the uh, icons from the map itself by clicking there. Another preview. This is from the St. Andrew's Church on Kent. Um, another option is you can also use the, the theme filters at the top to kind of filter what artifacts you'll see based on their theme. So if I want to see all the artifacts that contain stories about prominent people, they're displayed here. It's also important to note that each uh, artifact uh, falls under more than one theme. And each artifact pop-up uh, contains the location from the map, the moment in history it's tied to its story or artifact label here in the 3D model viewer, as well as the option to view that artifact in the collection side of the site. So we can go there now. So the collection side of the site kind of functions like a database where you can view all the models, their labels, the tombstone information without that storytelling experience. So this is best used for research and reference. And you can explore the collection by using the filters alongside the screen here to help narrow down what you want to see. So you can narrow it down based on theme, uh, based on uh, if it's an artifact on display at the museum or in our storage and which time period in the history of Ottawa it falls into here under the eras. So if I want to see the prominent people artifacts, there they are displayed. Same thing if I want to see the ones in storage, these are the artifacts in storage as part of the project. And if I wanted to see everything that falls in the Ottawa time period, it's there. Um, another option from this first page is you can also use the search filter 
to search for specific titles, keywords, or materials. So if I type in wood, all the artifacts that are made of wood or contain the word wood in their descriptors will pop up. And if you want to access an individual artifacts uh, page, you could just click on the icon from here. So I'll click on this gavel from the Bytown Sons of Temperance chapter. And here you'll find the artifacts tombstone information up top. So the artist maker, the date, material, artifact number, its label, which is the same that is displayed on the map side, the 3D model viewer here as well, as well as some related images. So this one here, we have a group photo from one of the chapters within the Ottawa region. And also has a full screen option to view the picture more fully, as well as the same for the 3D model viewer there. Um, as well, the filters that the artifact falls under will appear at the bottom of the page and they kind of act like tags and they are clickable. So uh, when you click one, it'll take you back to the collection homepage with that filter applied. So if I click in storage, it takes me back to the page, the homepage of the collection side of the site with that filter applied. So that really is a little look at the uh, website that's going to be launching soon and kind of what it covers. Uh, and with that, that really concludes uh, the formal portion of tonight's Beyond By Town. Um, but I just wanna say that I'm really excited that this project is gonna be in the hands of the public very soon after working on it for a year. It's really great to see how it all came together. And I'm looking forward to, how, to see how you all interact with it and engage with the models and their stories. And just want to say thanks to Sims, uh, who are really pivotal in making stories from the collection happen, namely Adam, Ben, Julia, Stephen, and Lori. Really great team working with them. Um, also, thanks to our partners at Wind Translation and Character Creative and the Government of Canada for funding this work. So I'll hand it back to SC for the Q&A portion for tonight. Great. Thank you so much, Chloe and Adam, uh, for that presentation. I've definitely learned a lot more now about how the photogrammetry process really works. Um, and it's been really exciting seeing this this project come together. Um, so again, thank you very much for, for sharing with us this evening. I have a, a couple of questions that uh, I have prepared for you guys, but uh, of course, to our audience who's watching, feel free to uh, pose any questions that you have for Chloe or Adam uh, in our Q&A section in our chat, and we'll be happy to ask those so that you guys can learn everything it is you wanted to know about uh, digitization, but maybe we're too afraid to ask until now. Uh, but my first question, I'll give some a chance for each of you maybe to answer with your picks, but uh, you, you mentioned that you started with a really long, long list of artifacts that you had to narrow down to just three. Uh, and so I'm curious to know for each of you, uh, which artifact that couldn't make it into the project would you most want to add uh, and maybe a little bit about its story? I, I can start because I definitely have an answer for that one. <laughs> um, one that I really wanted to be a part of the project, but I knew it was maybe a bit unrealistic going in, it was a lot to ask for, is this really large cash register that we have in the collection that is actually from, I can't remember the name of it now, but it's from a former jewelry store on Spark Street that closed down uh, sometime in the 20th century. And um, it's just really beautiful and ornate and like very like has all a bunch of like bejeweled buttons and drawers it looks really really beautiful um and a good connection there is in the museum itself for any visitors who have been into the building on the third floor of the museum two of our display cases up there are actually from the same jewelry store so it would have really been nice to have like a good connection for something in storage for in the museum but um adam saw it it's like huge heavy super detailed and in one of the most awkward spots in our storage unit. So it just wouldn't, it wasn't super feasible to move it accordingly and with the time constraints that we had to do it. Um, I don't know if you wanna talk a bit more about why we couldn't do it, Adam, but. <laughs> yeah, sure. That was actually, I was just thinking of that one too. That would have been fun to, to yeah. scan. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was, it was quite large and heavy and we have to, 
it was sort of at the back of of the room with uh with a series of other objects around it but also we need a certain amount of space around around the object to be able to to scan it and then of course flipping it would have been a challenge as well probably impossible to have it supported upside down yeah those cast registers are very heavy i remember now you sending me a photograph of it um I'm curious, Adam, if you had an an object in mind that you maybe would have wanted to add. Uh, yeah, I actually wanted to just do the whole tool chest and all of the tools inside, because uh, I'd like to see. I do some. I I follow some historical woodworking people, and they they reconstruct tool chests. So it would have been it would be cool to see all of the tools in detail um, that were used by John Summers on the on the Rio Canal. And then I could have my own. I'll make my own. <laughs> yeah, for, for that one, we were able to model two of the artifacts in it. So on the website, in um, on the collection side of the site for the page for the carpenter's chest, the models appear there. We have, uh, I think it's a wooden mallet and a plane. And the plane is actually stamped with the Jay Summers uh, stamp because he made the chest but also quite a lot of the tools in there as well so when we did do a couple of the items from the chest we wanted to make sure we had one with that like stamp on it so yeah for sure that's that's so cool because now it's like his fingerprint is is in the in the digital world um Judith Parker with a comment about uh, the vintage cash registers that a visitor once commented that this cash register was a precursor of today's computers. Uh, I was shown in an exhibition in the museum around 2010, and that's definitely a good way of thinking about them. I think it's really amazing what they were able to do mechanically without without having uh, need for electricity. So definitely very cool. Um, a question now from uh, Rich Pickering to Adam, uh, what software do you use to uh, handle the processing of the uh, artifacts? So we, for the pre-processing of the photos, we use the uh, Adobe Photoshop uh, Camera Raw editor. Uh, and then to actually process the 3D models, we use, we, we use both uh, Metashape, Agisoft Metashape, and um, capturing reality. Reality capture is the is the brand and name of software. But for this project, we only used uh, Metashape. Yeah. Great. Cool. Hopefully that that answers. Uh... No question. I think it might also answer uh, a little bit the next question that we have here from Golnush Nasari, which uh, is sort of a question in three parts. The first being, did you use Blender for processing the models, um, which it sounds like you spoke to a little bit, but uh, the other parts of the question, uh, what were the challenges of shooting outside, namely in this case uh, of the lock system, uh, and how did you overcome those challenges? And finally, can you tell us a little bit more about ways of making sure you will get good results when you're dealing with more than two chunks for modeling? Uh, okay. so. The first question, uh, we actually did use Blender for some uh, post-processing of the models. So we're, some of the areas didn't uh, build very nicely. We were able to sculpt them back into back into place with Blender. And then sometimes we actually, we can export them to Blender, uh, fix them up, and then put them back into the photogrammetry software and put the texture on them afterwards. Sometimes we're able to do that. And then shooting outside for the locks. Uh, so the challenge with the Bytown Museum, the um, I guess the south and east view of the of the museum is really easy to access. You can see it. Um, the the hill actually slopes up, so you get a good view from from both sides. the The challenging views were the north side. You could you can see some of the building. Uh, but you can't get very high. It starts to slope down. There's actually like a, a there's a retaining wall and then it steps down. So it's hard to to also get up, uh, um, get far enough back, but also high enough at the same time. But the hardest part is the west side of the building, where is the hill to Parliament Hill, basically. And that's a forested area. So there's a lot of trees. So you can like, you can kind of walk up. Actually, no, you're not supposed to walk up on the hill. Uh, but if you were to, uh, there are trees in the way of taking the photos. So those trees get in the way of the of the photogrammetry photos. 
Um, so we got around that by using by using the pole. We used the pole mainly on that west side and some on the east side to get the um, to get the walls and the roof. We also used that telephoto lens to get most of the uh, east roof, east side of the roof. We actually went up um, on the on the walkway uh, past Chateau Laurier and then past the statue of uh, Colonel John Bai. We walked along there with a with a telephoto lens so you could actually zoom in uh, to like the telephoto lens is awesome. You could actually see like the grain on the wood shingles of the of the building. So we're able to use that technique to get the uh, to get the roof of, of that of that part. And I realized when I was up there that Colonel Bai is his statue is perfectly in line with the commissariat building. I, I, I didn't know that was before. So <laughs> that, was a, that was a discovery. It was cool. Uh, yeah, for sure. And then the third question, um, getting good results when I'm dealing with more than two chunks. Um, I, it's dealing with more than two chunks is, is, isn't much different than, um, dealing with, with two chunks. It's, it's, uh, I guess it, on, uh, on the processing side, it's not much different. You're processing them and, and you align them together the same way. Um, it's just knowing um, how, when you're taking the photos, how are you gonna, like, you know, you take photos of one portion of it and then you take photos of another portion of it. Do you have enough overlap between those two portions so that it can align together? That's that's the biggest challenge when you're, when you're flipping the object and you're dealing with multiple orientations. Hope yeah. That, that answers the question. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adam. That's that's really great. Definitely speaking a little to the technical side of it, but also some of the some of the maybe unique challenges about trying to 3D model something as large as a building, which is uh amazing to 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 think about. I love to imagine the digital dollhouse uh that you can make uh afterwards. Um another uh question that uh I I have prepared for you guys uh is uh once this uh, project is made public uh, for folks to access it, uh, are people free to use the three models for other projects? And how would you hope people make use of these assets? Um, that, if they can use them, that'll be done on like a case-by-case -case basis, kind of when we do like reproduction work with the museum and that all goes to the all request for that. We'll go to uh, Grant, the senior manager for collections and exhibitions. but. Um, I'm definitely, I think it'd be really cool for folks to use models. Um, I know like the Baita Museum, we visited Ingenium for their digital innovation lab a couple months ago and just seeing kind of the work that they've done there to animate um, some models of, from artifacts from their collection has been really cool because you can kind of gamify like history that way or just use them a bit more uh, interactively and engagingly in like museum exhibits themselves just to increase that interactivity um, I think would be really cool um, and maybe if people have their own personal connections to the objects that we've done in the project I'd be really interested to know or if there's different objects out there that we can connect to different museums I think would be really awesome yeah great yeah, I'm really excited to being uh, to showing these objects to to folks uh, once once the website is live and once we have the the in gallery portion. Definitely going to be very exciting to get people to get hands on with the objects in a in a virtual way. Uh, another question that I I've got prepared for you guys um, is what advice would you give to maybe hobbyist collectors or other museums that are looking to make uh, digital models of their collections or undertake a digitization project? So sort of what what would be some of the biggest lessons learned from this project that you might want to share? Um, do, do you want to start, Adam? Or sure, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, keep it simple, especially if you're just starting out. Photogrammetry is like what's great about it is that it's uh, low cost, so you really just need a, a camera. the The quality of camera um, has has a has a decent effect on on the quality of your models, and and then the software to process it. And there are free softwares out there to be able to do that. Um, but it, it it does take a bit of skill to be able to do it. 
uh, but it but it's it, it is accessible. So if you're just starting out, choose the simpler objects to do first, and then you can start building your skill and and collection at the same time. Yeah, I definitely agree on keeping it simple. I know when I like made that list at the beginning, I definitely like shot for the stars and I was able to definitely like achieve that through Adam's help and expertise with Sims. Like the commissary building I thought was like a super big ass, but we were able to do it. So I'm really happy for that. Um, but then there's other things like the cash register. And I know initially I had some like really large pieces of furniture and it's just, I think just knowing it's time consuming. And if you're in some time constraints, just keeping that in mind. Um, Cause I think when we were doing, when we were at the defense bunker doing like the capturing sessions, um, so I think the smallest thing we did was like a, a little medallion coin and that would only take like a couple hours, but something like, uh, like the carpenter's chest, like took like maybe more like a day to do. So just keeping that in mind, um, but also keep it simple, but I think I underestimated the, um, like the 3d of it all. Like when I was making that initial list, I really wanted to select artifacts that were like really eye-catching but something even like clothing may not like be an immediate thought to model but there's like a lot of texture that gets picked up and we ended up doing a clothing item and I'm really glad that we did because it's like a really cool alternative to some of the other objects we've done and even we didn't do this for this project but we've talked to Adam about like paintings and like artwork can also be really um, like valuable in their model as well so lots of options yeah definitely pick some cool things though because yeah, i imagine project being excited. able to pick up textures yeah and there were cool objects yeah was... great thank you so much for for sharing some of those oh yeah yeah even the gavel you think an object like that i was almost mesmerized just with the the level of detail um but uh I guess then kind of related to chain into that a little bit. Um, what would be, if you had to pick one, what is your personal favorite of the objects that are included in the project? Mine has been the brush, I think from day one. So <laughs> I will say that and I'm glad I included it tonight. Cause again, it's more of the story that I really like about it. Um, but yeah, that's just always my favorite. I feel like it's just like kind of, to me, it's like what the project is, is that little brush. So that's my favorite. But I think I also really like the scale that Adam showed. Like that's one of my favorite. It was like models after we did the work. Looks really great. Yeah, I won't, uh, you can probably guess that it might, mine might be the tool chest, but I, I won't, I won't be repetitive uh i'll say the mayor's chair the mayor's chair turned out really nice and it had a lot of different textures uh like the the worn leather on the seat and the, and the back and the arms too uh and then the nice carving on the on the head of the chair and then some of the some of the lining on the back of the chair turned out really nice yeah great i I do think it, the, the all the objects are, are definitely telling very, very unique stories. So it's great to see your different perspectives on which ones you're, you're drawn to. Um, I've got one more question that's prepared to you, and maybe this one's a little more philosophical, but um, after having interacted with these objects, both in a digital and in a physical form, um, do you think that there is something lost in the digitization project? And is anything gained in experiencing, experiencing these objects as di digital? models I don't know I think the detail is like really captured <laughs> through the model so I don't know if anything I would say is like majorly lost and um obviously like we were able to like touch the artifacts when we were mod like when we were doing the digitization work but that's and we did that super carefully you know with like the proper equipment and things like that but that's something that the public can't necessarily do but I think this is a really good alternative and this also opens up the doors to like potentially like 3D printing some of the artifacts as well to kind of bridge that like tactile and access point. Um, so other than like physically touching the artifact, <laughs> that's the only thing that's lost. I really think a lot of the details really captured and and in that way, um, one artifact I didn't necessarily show, but it's at the museum for folks that have, that have been there is a memoryware jar that we have on display at the museum on the third floor. So for something like that, it's a very 360 object. It's got lots of 
um, like household objects like infused into it in clay. And with it being on display at the museum, there's no mirror behind it. You can't turn it, it's just in its display case. So now with this model, what can be gained is that full like 360 view of it. And even like Adam was able to model like the interior of it, which you can't see it at the museum. So it definitely adds more detail for those ones that are on display at the museum that you're not able to see otherwise, unless we like flip things around. And yeah, that would be my answer. Great. Adam, I don't know if you have anything to add. Sure. Yeah. I, I like to think about it, especially the, it's easier to see on the, on the actual scanning side, but I like to think about it like, um, wearing like x-ray goggles, you know, you can see things that you wouldn't, you might not have seen before, um, by just handling it regularly, but you can't walk around all day with x-ray goggles on it. You wouldn't be able to navigate so that's that's kind of the difference between the real object and the and the digital object that I that I see. Yeah, I love that. It's a great metaphor. The X-ray goggles. That's great. Um, we have a few more minutes for questions. If anybody from the audience would like to ask a question of Chloe or Adam, uh, also just want to double check for our friends who are watching on Facebook Live. Uh, I know that our uh, our uh, communications manager has been monitoring the chat there. So if anyone watching on Facebook wants to ask a question, now now's your chance. Um, but uh, we should be expecting uh, that the uh, the project will be available to the public soon, which is super exciting. Uh, we've got a question coming in now from Bill Vogel. Um, realizing that obviously this is quite an expensive process, what would be a realistic number of artifacts to digitize in 3D? I suppose if you've got uh, budget constraints. I guess I can answer. Uh, it really depends on the level of detail that you want. You know, some of the objects took uh, over a day to capture, but if um, if we did it at a lower lower detail, you know, it might have taken a couple minutes, maybe uh, ten minutes to capture. Um, so it depends on the level of detail, um, the kind of equipment that you have. And the complexity of the object is another another big one. So it's hard to it's hard to just say a number. Um, we we did we were we we were doing up to thirty objects. So we tried to get a good a nice level of detail and quality to those thirty objects. That, that's kind of how we handled it. Hopefully that answers the question. Yeah. And uh, Chloe, I think, had mentioned the um, Digital Innovation Lab at the Science and Tech Museum. So there's definitely lots of um, resources available, especially to, to other community museums that are interested in, in tackling digitization um, to, to look for in the community. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if Chloe had anything to add about, like, how you arrived at the number of, of 30 objects. Uh, yeah, it was just kind of what we budgeted for based on like um, the grant money that we had and the side from Sims. Uh, I think it's also important to note like the time commitment, which I think we've kind of talked about. Like, I think we were pretty consistently doing it once a week, maybe a couple times a week, uh, occasionally from I think like June to like October, I think was the time commitment that we did. So it definitely is time consuming, but doable when you have the resources and tools at your disposal, which we were thankful and lucky to have so yeah and uh sort of relatedly we've got a question from uh lynn on facebook who's asking how affordable this sort of project would be for a smaller museum and if the funding is there for seasonal museums as well yeah well the Baita museum is a small museum so we were able to do it through like a government of canada grant so there's definitely grants out there for these like especially now with these like digital projects it's very important and a big focus right now to get collections online or just increase that access so the grants are out there for sure so yeah and i know adam you mentioned that there were some free tools available for people who are interested in in uh experimenting with digitization do you have a recommendation for like the best free uh tool that people can use to sort of play around with yeah for sure so the the uh imaging processing software 
a, a free one is raw therapy um with two e's at the end and then there is a free photogrammetry software called meshroom i believe i've only tried it once i haven't had great results from it um, but that's the free option and then there's also so the other software i mentioned that we didn't use for this project uh, reality capture so that has a, di a couple different options for um for licensing so you can buy I think it's a, I think it's a subscription based license and, and there's different, there's different tiers as well. You know, like you're a student or you're uh, a professor, an, an institution, you know, maybe the by town museum, they'll have a, they'll have a, a license for the by town museum as, as being a heritage institution. Uh, but also they do, you can pay per, um, it's PPI, I can't remember what the I stands for, but basically you pay at the end of your model when you're ready to export and it depends on the size of your model. So it could be like a couple bucks per model for, for the software. Uh, yeah. So that, that's reality capture. That's a, that's a really good option for it to be able to be accessible. Cool. Yeah. It sounds like there's lots of, lots of different options for people who are looking to sort of maybe dip their toes into a little bit of the, the photogrammetry or, or digitization work with this. Uh, one last question for the evening from Keith Hobbs, any museum collection role for Apple's spatial video? Oh, I don't know. I actually haven't heard of that. So no, I'm, I'm not familiar either. Yeah. I, I have to look into that. <laughs> Is that, yeah. I think, is that where they, it's like a video and it like rotates back and forth? Is that, I, I think I've seen, I'm a, I have an Android, so I, I'm a, <laughs> sorry. Maybe, and there may be a museum collection role for, for Apple's mm -hmm. spatial video, maybe more research needed. Uh, and we also have uh, a lovely comment from, from Paige, uh, just uh, thanking you guys again for, for an excellent presentation and, and for, for all the learning. I think it's definitely been a great introduction to a topic that can be uh, a little bit uh, tricky for people, a little technical. Um, so yeah, thank you very much again. Just thank you to Adam and Chloe for presenting today. Thank you to uh to david for our communications manager who's been um, monitoring our facebook live and monitoring all of our q a's uh so thank you uh to to uh to david for for that um also thank you to everybody who has uh asked a question for adam and chloe everybody who has tuned in for this presentation uh this evening uh i uh want to mention that uh we run these presentations for free uh and that we're a registered not for profit Profit, but we always accept donations and you guys are in luck because we do have a digital donation option if you'd like to um, offer us something for uh, the presentation today. So thank you very much. David has dropped the link to our donation page uh, in the chat. So if you would like to leave a donation after today's presentation, we would really much uh, appreciate it. Uh, we will be posting once the uh, stories from the collection website is live. It should be in the coming uh, weeks. Uh, so please stay tuned on our social media pages. You can follow us at Bytown Museum uh, anywhere you get your social media. Um, so once again, I'd just like to say thank you very much to everybody who joined us this evening for this uh, today's session of Beyond Bytown. Uh, and I uh, hope you guys have a really, really excellent uh, rest of your evening. I will mention also that this is the last Beyond Bytown session for our uh, spring and winter 2024 season. Um, so stay tuned in the fall for our uh, follow up to the, the spring portion of our season. But uh, thank you very much for, for everyone who's tuned into our Beyond Bytown uh, sessions these past uh, uh, few months. And uh, I hope to see you guys uh, in the summertime when we open up the museum to the public as well. Uh, so I'll wish everybody a pleasant evening. And uh, again, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks. It was a pleasure. Good night. Yeah. All right. Good thank night, you. everyone. Bye.